John Russell and Rick Hickman back with you. And if, like the two of us, you were a huge fan of Paul Revere and the Raiders and TV shows like Where the Action Is and Happening, then you'll be thrilled to know that our guest this morning is none other than the lead singer that took that band to the heights of success as we welcome to the Saturday Morning Jukebox, Mr. Mark Lindsay. Hey there, guys. I'm glad to be here. Uh, It's a treat for us, Mark. And first of all, I guess we can simply ask, how was it that you were first drawn to music? I started singing uh, In the Womb. No, I'm (laughs) not not sure about that. But uh, my earliest memories are uh, listening to the radio and hearing the songs, and I started singing along. And at the age of four, I think it was, three or four, uh, I had a sister that was a year or two older than me, and we used to sing in harmony around the house. And we went to see a band in a park that was near us in Caldwell, Idaho. And the entertainment didn't show up. The band didn't show up, so the, D, so the MC is saying, well, you know, the band's not here, but anybody out there can sing a song or uh, say a poem or something. And my mom raised her hand and said, well, my kids can sing. So we got up and we sang uh, You Are My Sunshine, the old uh, Jimmy Rogers song, right? The guy lowered the microphone for me way, I think I had to reach up to it at its lowest height. But I remember singing and watching the crowd smiling, I thought, man, this is fun. This is a good thing. And from then on, I was hooked. Fantastic. Well, you were born uh, out in in, in Oregon, and uh, it was kind of a crowded family. What, you were one of eight children, I understand? Yeah, but most of them didn't come along. It was just me and my sister until I was 15. Ah. And at age 15, age 15, I left and hit the road, and then the rest of the family started coming along. Well, actually, I had a, a young, couple younger sisters uh, just, just before I left. So, so the population explosion hit after you left home, kind of, huh? <laughs> yeah, I guess I guess they were trying to make up for the great loss. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, talk, an interesting story, of course, uh, was how you met Paul Revere, and you two would would form, of course, uh, this legendary uh, this legendary group. Um, it was uh, kind of an interesting meeting. I understand what you uh, you were working at a bakery, and he uh, he came in there to to, uh, to buy some hamburger buns, right? Yeah. Well, what had happened the night before? Uh, there was, uh, I was rehearsing with, a, I was with a band at that time called Freddie Chapman and the Idaho Playboys, and it was a country band, and I was the rockabilly singer. But right across the street from the guitar player, uh, there was a hamburger stand, and uh, uh, Revere had a little white house next to it, and I could hear this rock and roll music, and he would, he would play and, and jam with his friends. So he was hired by a band uh, about that time, and they were rehearsing there. And uh, the first gig they did was at the uh, the Elks Lodge in Caldwell, Idaho. So I heard about this this you know this uh, concert. I went, man, it's all rock and roll. That's what I really want to do. I mean, country's cool, and I get to sing rockabilly. But man, an all rock and roll band. That's what I want to do. So Saturday night, I kind of kind of crashed in there, and I wore real thick glasses uh, all my most of my life. So I didn't have my glasses on because I didn't, I didn't want to be <laughs> uncool. So I'm. I can't see anything, but I can hear the music in the corner, so I kind of like went through the crowd, and I remember the crowd parted like the Red Sea, like, here's this crazy skinny kid with this wild look in his eyes. So I walk up to the bandstand, and they finished their tune, I said, hey, I want to sing a song. And they went, hey, get out of here, kid. And then somebody said, well, you know, let's let him do it, it might be funny. Uh. So they, they asked for what I knew, and I said, anything, <laughs> which of course wasn't true, but he said, well, how about... You know any Jerry Lee stuff? And I said, sure. I mean, Jerry Lee, Lee Lewis, right? Mm-hmm. And he said, how about Crazy Arms, which was the flip side of, uh, I don't know, one of his big hits. But I happened to know it. I said, sure. So I got up and sang. And for that three minutes, it was just like being four years old again. I was watching the crowd as much as I could see the people standing in the front row, maybe. And it was great. I was kind of catapulted to another place. and was wonderful. But as soon as the music was, uh, the song was over, I, I got real nervous and shy, and they just kind of split and ran out of the place. Now, fast forward to the next day, which is Sunday, and as you said, Revere came down to pick up the hamburger buns because on Sunday, McClure's Bakery, where I was working, didn't deliver. Uh-huh. So I'm the last person. I'm the last person in the bakery. I've got my long baker's apron on and my baker's hat and my thick glasses covered with flour, <laughs> and he comes in and. and I'm waiting for his order, which I'm wrapping up. And he says, you know, the funniest thing happened last night. We played at the Elks Lodge right up the street. I said, yeah. He said, yeah, it was a great dance. But in the middle of the dance, this weird thing happened. This crazy, skinny kid came up and demanded to sing a song. 
And I said, well, how was he? He said, well, he wasn't bad. And I whip off my hat and my glasses. I said, that was me. So, so he said, you're not bad, kid. Come on down and rehearse any time. And, and uh, shortly thereafter, he got fired from the band he was in. And we decided to start a band called The Downbeat which evolved into Paul Revere and the Raiders, and the rest, as they say, is history. So that uh, Superman Clark Kent disguise really does work, just a pair of glasses, I guess, right? <laughs> uh, that's it, and, and, and I've been shy all my life. It's, it's, there's like two Mark Lindsay's. There's one that gets on stage and kicks ass, um, uh, well, yeah, sure, or whatever, and uh, rocks and rolls, and uh, there's the other guy that's just just a normal, just quiet like Mark Lindsay, you know? <laughs> So, so it is. I'm, I, I kind of feel like Superman in a way. I, I'm Clark Kent most of the time, but once in a while I get to put on my cape. And, <laughs> and uh, I used to put on my three-cornered hat and my lace dickie, but now it's just an imaginary <laughs> cape, and I get out and, and do it again. We're talking to Mark Lindsay, and just before you and Paul Revere changed from the downbeats to Paul Revere and the Raiders, you cut a record that went on to great fame for another band. I'd love to hear that story. We're in, we're in Portland, Oregon. The band has reformed. We took a two-year hiatus when Paul went into the service. Mm. I went down to California to keep the band going, and we toured as Paul Revere's Raiders, and Leon Russell was the keyboard on keyboards. Amazing. A little-known fact. So we did that, and we got back together. And watching Leon, I, I came back and said, Paul, you know, it's not good enough just to be a band. We've got to be a, a show band. We've got to just be the wildest.
the biggest hit that the uh, the Raiders had was a song that actually you really did kind of on your own. I'm talking to Indian Reservation. Talk to us about kind of that weird story and how that all came about and how it got released as a, a Paul Revere and Raiders song. Yeah, well, John, uh, excuse me, Jack Gold, who was the head of A&R at CBS, is the guy that found Arizona for me and, and talked me into doing uh, ballads as, as an aside to the Raiders. And after uh, Arizona went platinum, he came to me uh, several months later, about, about a year later, and said, I've got your next single. So I said, sure, let's hear it. So I go into his office, and he plays Indian Reservation. And I knew the tune. I said, Jack, I said, I hate to tell you this, but this song was out about six months ago here in the States, and it only made it up to the, I don't know, the 50s or 60s and fell off the charts by, by uh, what was the guy's name that had it? Uh, I'll think of it in a minute. But anyway, he said, well, yeah, that may be so, but right now it's number one in England, and uh, you're part Native American, aren't you? I said, yeah, I have some Cherokee in me. He said, well, this is perfect for you. So he said, I want you to do it. So he called Jerry Fuller, my producer, the guy that produced Arizona and Silverbird, uh-huh. and said, I've got Lindsay's, got Lindsay's new song here, so uh, I want you to cut it. And Jerry said, I can't. I'm busy with uh, Gary Puckett, and I've got uh, two or three other things on the fire, and I can't do it right now. So Jack comes back and says, okay, Lindsay, you produce it. And I said, no, wait a minute. I'm producing the Raiders, but that's different. I can be a little more objective about that because I'm just one guy. But I can't produce me because <laughs> that's how do I be, how can I be objective about that? Right. But he said, hey, you you got to do it. So I went in and got the best musicians I could find and uh, got Artie Butler, the guy that did Arizona for me, cut the track. And it came out incredibly. I thought, man, this is this is happening. But I was so close to it that I couldn't really decide. I mean, I I, I could usually pick one of our records and and get a chart chart position within five points either way. I could say, okay, this is going to be uh, like fifteen to twenty, uh, you know, whatever. But Indian Reservation, I thought it truly that it was either going to be the biggest hit we'd ever had or the biggest flop we'd ever had. But I, so I really couldn't call it. And so Jack says, look, if you're, you know, I think this is a great single for Mark Lindsay, but if you're really, you're really ambivalent about it, let's put it out under the name of the Raiders. So we did that. And of course, <laughs> it became the biggest selling single in the history of CBS to that time and the biggest record the Raiders never played on. They took the whole Cherokee Nation. Took away our ways of life The tomahawk and the bow and knife Took away our native tongue And taught their English to our young
Cherokee Nation will return, will return, will return, will return, will return. Speaking of that now, obviously that's at the tail end of your relationship with the Raiders. Was it a thing, uh, Mark, that whole thing had just kind of run its course? Well, I guess it was kind of like any relationship, like a marriage. You're together for a long time and it works and then you kind of grow apart. And that's kind of how it was with the Raiders toward the end. Paul wasn't really that flexible musically, and I was, as you say, I was wanting to stretch out a little bit. So there, was, there came a time when we just didn't see exactly eye to eye, so I left the group. And the band actually broke up then for about a year and a half. A year and a half, two years later, Paul started another group called Paul Green Raiders. But not, you know, it wasn't really, it was more with a whimper than a bang. <laughs> <laughs> it was just, just kind of like, uh, it, it, it was time. We had a great run. I think uh, Revere and I were together for like 15 years from, what, 1958 to uh, 70. So we had a good run. It worked for a while, and when it worked, it worked great. And as you mentioned, you'd already started some solo projects, had success with Arizona. How did you come to record that great song? I was getting ready ready to record a song called Let Me. Uh, That song, by the way, I think only made it to the 30s and and finally went gold, which is uh, weird to me. But anyway, I'm in the studio getting ready to do the vocals on Let Me, and the engineer in the booth said, give me some vocal level. Instead of belting out Let Me, I had just run into Johnny Mathis in the hallway because at CBS, you'd run into Johnny Mathis, uh, Dylan, uh, the birds. You know, it, just, it was like a constant. It was like kind of a who's who in the music business there. Man. So I had just seen Johnny, so when he said, give me a level, I started singing, Chances are, since I wear a silly grin, the moment you come into view. And I just sang a few lines of it. Well, Jack Gold happened to be passing by, and he stuck his head in the booth about that time. So he'd never heard me sing like that. So he calls me to his office the next day. He said, okay, Lindsay, you're going to do an album of ballads. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, I heard you doing Johnny Mathis. I said, no, no, I wasn't doing Johnny Mathis. Only Johnny Mathis can do Johnny <laughs> Mathis. He said, yeah, but I want you to do some some uh, a softer side, Mark Lindsay. So that's... How I began to do Arizona and things, but it was really because I was just goofing off <laughs> in the studio. She must belong to San Francisco. She must have lost her way. Posting a poster of Poncho and Cisco one California day. She says she believes in a Robin Hood and Brotherhood and colors of green and gray. And all you can do is laugh at her. Doesn't anybody know how to pray? You're acting like a teeny bopper runaway child And scrape off the paint from the face of a little town saint I will be guide you away I'll be the count of Monte Cristo You'll be the countess man You can believe in Robin Hood and Brotherhood And rolling the ball in the hay
it had to be such a surreal time. And like I said, we've talked with Tommy James, Rick and I in the past, and, and Gary Puckett and those guys, and, and Bobby Goldsboro about, hey, I'm, I'm sitting down, I'm talking to Bob Dylan, or hey, I had dinner with the Beatles and stuff like that. I mean, it, it was really, I mean, it, it's over simplistic to say it was a magical time, but it really was a magical time, wasn't it? I mean, even, as you're in the middle of all that, did you say, hey, hey, I'm out hanging out with Dylan and stuff like that? Or was it just uh, just like hanging out with, with your best friends and it wasn't a big deal? No, it was it was a big deal. There was a there was one day at CBS. CBS had like actually had four recording studios and two overdub studios and a couple of mixing suites. So one day, I'm in there. The association is in one room. Sly and the Family Stone are in another. The the Birds are in another. The Raiders are in another. Janis Joplin was doing some overdubs in a room, and uh, <laughs> I was talking to Linda Ronstead for about half an hour trying to cheer her up in the hallway because her band, the Stone Ponies, had just broke up. Of course, she went on to bigger and better things. I walked in the commissary and literally bumped into Dylan. So I'm thinking about this. I'm thinking, man, if a bomb drops on this place today, this is going to put a big dent in the talent pool uh, of the U.S. It was pretty surreal. Oh, man, it certainly was that. And and then, uh, I mean, the, the stuff that you've done, obviously you went on your, your solo career and stuff like that, but, I mean, you were you talked about being, you know, working with an, a lot of A&R men. You actually became an A&R man. I mean, you really saw this business from being a writer to a producer to a musician to be in the promotions business. I mean, you have been all over this business, haven't you, Mark? Yeah, well, that's that's kind of how I got the gig for, for A&R at United Artists. Uh, they, the guy called me in and said, we're looking for a new A&R man. I said, well, I've been a writer, a producer, a, a, an artist, a publicist. I think I know the music business, so I'll give it a try. And it was a great experience for me as a songwriter because the minute I got the gig, all my friends called up and said, hey, I want to give me on the label. I had to explain why we didn't need that band at that time. Uh-huh. Or I'd get all these songs and I'd have to tell people, and rather than just reject it, they said, well, why don't you want it? And I had to explain to them why the song didn't work either for, for the label or for the times or whatever it was. And by analyzing what was wrong with the tunes that I was getting and being able to uh, verbalize it to people, I became more aware of my writing skills and what I was and wasn't doing. And uh, to that end, <laughs> I'm working on a new project right now that uh, where I'm using all this knowledge, hopefully, that I've acquired. And I think it's some of the best stuff I've written since uh, since the 60s. It'll be out maybe six months, a year, and we'll see. We'll just have to wait and see. Well, that's that's fantastic. Also, you've done movie scores and things like that. You know, I wanted to be a singer all my life, but I was this geeky kid, skinny kid with glasses, and I thought, no, nah, it'll never happen. So I thought, I'll be a DJ. Uh-huh. I used to go down to the KGM radio and, and pull out the AP copy out of the dumpster and go home and practice uh, Washington, Secretary of State, Dallas. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> I always wanted to be a DJ because I thought I'd never make it as a singer. Years later, about, uh, oh, I don't know, three or four years ago, we were living in Portland and Oregon, and I had a chance to do a show called Mark After Dark. And it's not as easy as it sounds, kids. I thought, hey, give me a mic and I'll just roll. But it's, it's not <laughs> like that. It's a whole different thing. But it was fun, and of course, just when we, just when I got to my my highest rating, somebody came in and bought the station and canned everybody. It wasn't that bad for me. I'd only been there for a couple of years, but there were some people that had been there for twenty years and it was their whole life, and they just got out in the streets. Too bad. I mean, that that's radio, you know. It's, Man, let's let's fast forward, I guess, to what you're doing right now. You you alluded to that project, and and you know the music business has changed, I guess, in, in a million ways, and in some ways maybe it hasn't at all. I guess what would you say that the uh, and then we'll focus in on what you're doing today, Mark. Uh, how how has the business changed, I guess, from from the time that you guys broke in? Well, in those days, you had a single but if you had a single you, you you hopefully had an album waiting you know in the can because the minute the single hit then you'd put out the album because the single was a promotional vehicle for the album uh and you it was sold through distributors and record stores and uh that was mainly how records were um, distributed nowadays you don't have to have an album if you if you don't want to you can just do a, one song a single and put it on the web, and if it's the right single, the right, the right sound, just the right exposure on on uh, Facebook and YouTube and Twitter and whatever, it can go viral, and you can have a hit. And of course, it's instead of 
going to your favorite record store, which doesn't exist anymore. You just download it, and, and hopefully uh, to not too many people hack into it and get it for free. Oh, hopefully they pay <laughs> iTunes or somebody, so you make some money. But uh, for in one way, it's the record business is totally, uh, totally gone upside down. I mean, it just doesn't exist the way it did. But there's more opportunities for small groups. They can they can play a gig. They can record their own stuff. They can sell it themselves. They can put it online. So it's in one way it's much more democratic, uh, and the other way uh, you can get robbed real easily. But hey, the music business is the music business. And in the beginning, if somebody would have said, "Look, I'll, I'll you pay me a nickel a record, <laughs> I'll <laughs> release your records," I probably would have done it because <laughs> it's just it's just getting the music out there. So it's a whole different. Um, whole different model now but it's it's working and music's still out there and people are still having hits so and there you go and more people can hear it now than ever you know you have a worldwide audience that can access, access it instantly now your stuff now mark how would you would you categorize it uh i'll just say it's an album for the times How's ah that? okay a little a little tease but, but, it, but it's but it's not rap it's not <laughs> <laughs> it's, an, it's an album more for the as you said we we're talking about music that was for a softer gentler time yeah hopefully it will uh elicit some of those memories it's kind of a comment on a lot of things uh, i can't get into it sure. too deep you'll just have to wait and hear it but uh, it's just it's just good music what can i say hey man if, if basically what i'm trying to do is make uh an album or a cd or a collection of downloadable uh digital bits that is just something that you want to put on and listen to. I'm trying to make a listenable album. That's what I'm trying to do. Sure. And would, would that be available through your website when the time comes? Or you, uh, Obviously, you'll be marketing it as well, but is that is that one of the uh, one of the outlets? Well, yeah. If people want to go to Mark Lindsay, M-A-R-K-L-I-N-D-S-A-Y, <laughs> marklindsay.com, they can keep up with what's going on. But when it comes out, I think uh, hopefully there'll be uh, some publicity and people will be able to find out about it. But that's always a good place to, to keep up with what's going on, that's for sure. And yeah. are you touring the rest of this year? Yeah, we're on the road with uh, Happy Together. Uh, that's out with uh, the Turtles, the Buckinghams. <laughs> Did we talk about this? Yeah, no, let's Turtles, talk about it right now. Uh, the grassroots. I'm leading somebody out. Uh, that, the Association? That, oh, the Association. Yeah, yeah. what a great uh, pairing of talents. Oh yeah, it's it's uh, like a two and two and a half hours of nothing but solid gold. You know, it's it's a lot of fun. And for you guys, I mean, obviously you 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 met back in the day and and we're working together with a lot of these guys. So it, it's it's a chance for you guys to kind of kick back and and reminisce and and, and tell some old war stories. I would imagine, right? Oh yeah, uh, and, <laughs> and just the fact that we're still alive and out there is amazing. I mean, so many so many uh, of my peers are are no longer. Yeah. With us, I mean, just in the Raiders, we lost Drake, the most incredible guitar player that I've worked with for years, a couple of years ago, and uh, Smitty a few years before that, the drummer, Mike Smith, a great lead singer from uh, the uh, Dave Clark Five, and it's so many people that are no longer with us. It's it's uh, it's sad. So I'm just glad to be able be able to get out there and. Keeps rocking and rolling. Rock and roll keeps you young, but you got to work at it. <laughs> you sure do. And uh, also, you've been traveling. I, we, we, how I came across you, I was just kind of trying to kind of catch up with you a little bit, and I, I ran across uh, your your website, and you were, uh, I think it's the, uh, the the traveling minstrel or something like that, where you're you're keeping folks up on on some of your travels. So obviously, you're getting out and just uh, just seeing the world a little bit now too, aren't you? Yeah, we're basically. I mean, uh, since in the last twenty years. Since I met my wife, we've lived in Oregon, California, Arizona, all those places twice, Nashville, Memphis, upstate New York, and Jupiter, Florida. And uh, we were in Florida about two or three years, and we started to get itchy again. And <laughs> she said, well, where can we go? And we looked at the map. We've been everywhere. So I, well, I forgot about Maui for eight years. Ooh. That, was, that was a nice little side trip. Yeah. But anyway... So Deb says, well, why don't we get an RV and just travel around a couple of years and see how we like it? If we don't like it, we'll settle down. So we've been doing it for the last almost nine months. And in that time, I've written more songs than I've written in the last 15 years. Wow. It's been like a total renaissance experience for me. I, I, I feel like I'm 18 again. 
In fact, I weigh the same as I did when I was 18. <laughs> and I've got that, got that kind of energy, and uh, like I'm just hungry for those good things, baby. And uh, I get out and and do five or six miles every day, and that's when I write in my head. And it's just incredible. We we move about all, all about every two weeks. Right now, I'm sitting looking at the Loxahatchee River and an old alligator swimming by, and it's uh, <laughs> it's I'm living the life. What can I say? The Happy Together Tour continues the rest of this month and August, and it'll roll from New York to California, Florida, and most states in between, so they'll certainly be appearing near you. Closest ones to us here in Michigan will be a couple of great dates in early August in Ohio, both Sylvania and Kettering, Ohio, and uh, certainly uh, will be a great show with Flo and Eddie of the Turtles, the Association, the Grassroots, the Buckinghams, and today's guest, Mark Lindsay. Hey, Mark, you're taking a long time with us here, but uh, we try to recap your life a little bit. and it's What a life it has been, and it's great to, to hear you in good voice and, and still out there uh, knocking them dead on the road after all these years. Well, I tell you, it's, uh, it's again, the, the new lifestyle has really, really changed my whole attitude. <laughs> and I truly feel, you know, if I don't look in a mirror, I feel like I'm in my 20s. So yeah. uh, it just, uh, it, it's just a, a great time to be alive. Music is good. Uh, some people are knocking the music today. I, I happen to like Lady Gaga. I, I like oh. some of her. She's a great, very talented person. I like Katy Perry. There's a lot of groups that, that are happening today that uh, are really cool, you know. Oh. So don't reject anything. And I, I, I hated some of the new music when it first came out, and then I decided, wait a minute. If I don't like it, I better find out why I don't like it. And so I got more into things. And some stuff I like, some stuff I don't. It's like any other genre of music, any other time. Mm-hmm. But there's still a lot of good stuff out there, including some of the classics. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I'll tell you what, what's a thrill for Rick and us here doing classic hits radio is certainly we have, you know, the, the, the gang that came up, listened to you guys at the time, and, and even their kids. But now all of a sudden we're getting the kids as kids. And, and when you get a call from a 20-something that wants to hear a Paul Revere and the Raiders or a Mark Lindsay or the Beatles or something like that, I mean, that's brand new music to, to that generation. And it's always a thrill for us, you know, because it just keeps the music alive, keeps the music going a little bit. Yeah, it's when I look out in the audience and I see three generations out there, and the the young kids know the words to the songs. I mean, they <laughs> uh, evidently they've got into their their the old vinyl that was stored in the basement, <laughs> <laughs> or or they're listening to your station. But sure. whatever it is, uh, music that worked for teenagers back in the day still works for teenagers back in this day. So uh, it's uh, it's a timeless music. And and uh, comment on that. Every other genre of music, whether it was swing, ragtime, uh, show tunes, good music, most music had a, had a ten year, fifteen year period when it was really popular. Right. And when rock and roll hit in the in the late fifties, people predicted it would last for either five to ten years and be gone. <laughs> and of course, rock and roll has refused to die. <laughs> so it, it's the longest longest. Uh, running genre of one form of music that I know of, except for, of course, classical. I mean, Mozart's always going to be Mozart, and always going to be good. <laughs> <laughs> well, Mark, we certainly appreciate all the great time that you shared with us today. And on top of that, of course, all the great hits, whether it was with Paul Revere and the guys, or whether your incredible solo career, and the things that you brought to television. A couple of very important uh, years for me when I got to watch that show is something you looked forward to at the end of every afternoon. And, uh, boy, it's meant a lot to us and uh, to share some time with you today. Well, thanks, guys. I really appreciate it. Thanks for taking the time, you guys. Uh, and thanks for sharing uh, some of my life with some of your listeners. And I hope to see everybody uh, that can out on the show, you know. Thank you, Mark and John. Just another great chat with one of our all-time favorites. And you can learn more at marklindsay.com, including that Happy Together tour schedule. I know you and I wish we were there. Don't forget, next Saturday, right here on the Saturday Morning Jukebox from 6 to 9, we'll welcome two brand-new sponsors to the show, Herbie's Cafe on Laketon, east of the freeway, and booked for the season on Lakeshore Drive in Lakeside. We'll have $20 gift certificates good at both of those fine establishments. Herbie's Cafe on Lakedon, of course, open for breakfast and lunch. And booked for the season on Lakeshore Drive is your book emporium. 
used books. They have books on consignment. And, of course, they're great for your own personal entertainment year-round. Stop in and say hello to Ashley. $20 gift certificates to both locations. We'll also get you registered for yet another chance to win a $25 Meyer gift card. Good at any of the Meyer locations in our area. And, of course, we'll have cinema carousel movie passes. So we've got the prize catalog just stuffed for a great Saturday morning jukebox next week. And as John and I say goodbye, have a wonderful weekend. And don't forget, I'll be on site at bike time beginning at noon today from Hot Rod Harley Davidson. John will be back here spinning all of your requests at 830-9830. Brian Howe of Bad Company on stage, completely free of charge tonight. Come on down, check out the things happening at bike time. Another wonderful part of your West Michigan summer. As John and I say goodbye until noon today, we'll leave you with another one of the classics from the great Mark Lindsay. Have a wonderful weekend, everyone. See you at bike time. Get aboard the silver bird to pardon gate 19. Satisfy your Walter Mitty mind, trying out a dream. Your sign is Capricorn in every corner of your mind. Says you'll remain my friend, my friend until you're mine. Silver bird, fly my lady away. Silver bird, take her over the bay. Silver bird, give my lady a ride and we'll see what's on the other side. Silver bird. Baby's no baby no more Silver Bird Till you're mine